Desmond, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and a very warm welcome to the lots and lots of um, subscribers, the wrong words, but viewers is probably a better word, who are joining us online. Uh, you are also most welcome. Um, for those who aren't familiar with our work or for whom it has been a while since you were here in person with us, the Coalition for Global Prosperity brings together senior leaders from faith, business, politics, um, the military, and uh, what we all have in common is a passionate belief that with an active international development strategy alongside an effective diplomacy and defence strategy, the UK and the West can be a real force for good, alleviate, alleviating poverty uh, and bringing freedom and prosperity to those who need it most. And today we are here to discuss a really important topic which really encapsulates all of that, the situation in Ukraine following the Russian invasion. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by um, an esteemed panel who I will introduce one by one very shortly. Uh, following that, we will have some opening remarks, then I will ask some questions to kick us off, and then I will turn to um, y uh, your good selves to pose some questions to our panel, and we will take some questions online too. So, without any further ado, um, our first speaker is Flick Drummond, who has been in public life for more than 30 years, is the Member of Parliament for Mayon Valley, and sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee um, and has a real interest in these topics. Flick, can I kick you off uh, to get us started? Yes, thank you. I just make correction, I'm not on the Foreign Affairs Committee, though I would like to be. Okay, well, <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> but I yeah, keep trying, anyway. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so before the, before the invasion, Ukraine was not a country that many people in the UK would have known much about, despite its size and importance. So the notion some people have of what is Europe, and who is, whoops, sorry, that's my, uh, my uh, <laughs> I'll put it behind me there. Um, uh, so what is Europe and who is European has been challenged as Ukraine arrived very suddenly at the focus of our attention. And I'm pleased the response in the, of people in the UK has been unequivocal and totally supportive of Ukraine and its people. So we must ensure that Ukraine gets all she needs militarily, whether we in the UK can supply it, or whether the UK can persuade others to make available their stocks. A lot of what Ukraine needs is relatively basic. Its troops are well trained and experienced, and they've been fighting Russian proxies for many years prior to this invasion, and they've benefited from our advice too. And last year I was on the Royal College Defence Studies course, and we had some Ukrainians on that course as well, so looking very much at strategy. Economically, we must be ready to contribute to supporting Ukraine after the war. And it's important for the world economy that Ukraine catches up again and is a stable and developing nation. Ukraine provides 10% of the world's wheat and 15% of its corn. And I hope that other international partners will continue that support and keep sanctions until Russia has backed down. <laughs> Whatever happens in the world, politically and economic fragility is a driver of problems which eventually arrive on our shores, often literally as people seek sh uh, safety here. That is the key, the key reason for our overseas aid programmes, their investment in our own security as well. The frontline states need our help to look after displaced Ukrainians. There are three million refugees in Poland, nearly a million in Romania, and hundreds of thousands in, Ukraine, in Hungary, Moldova, and Slovakia. It is vital that these states are supported economically. And again, this is not a commitment which ends just as the ceasefire takes hold. This crisis is going to take a long time to recover. From in, in all of those states, not only in Ukraine. The wider consequences of this invasion are already clear, with Finland and Sweden looking to join NATO, and I expect agreement will be reached with Turkey on this shortly. Further ahead is the integration of Ukraine further into European markets and institutions, something the UK should, be readily, uh, should readily support. Putin has already failed in his objective of isolating and destroying the Ukraine, as I'm sure he realises already. The British people have shown how already how willing they are to support Ukrainians individually by opening their homes to them. It is important that the message goes out to Putin from as many countries as possible. And I've had some frank conversations myself with representatives of some of those states who've dragged their feet. Saudi Arabia, we have some Saudi Arabian 
um, MPs last week, and mm -hmm. I made it very clear that they should really be behind us. And they were quite surprised, actually, how, how Ukraine features in the UK, and they've seen all the flags and things. So if we can have more relations with countries which are, are being a bit slower, that's mm -hmm. the better. We can all influence the outcome of this conflict by, by our own moral and practical support for the people of Ukraine, wherever we, whoever we are and wherever we are in politics. Thank you very much, Flick. Our next speaker is Kirsty McNeil, who is the Executive Director for Policy, Advocacy and Campaigns at Save the Children. Kirsty leads teams to galvanise the public and influence policymakers on humanitarian action, global development and help for children here in the UK. Uh, Kirsty is also on the board of the Coalition for Global Prosperity, the Holocaust Educational Trust, and is a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Kirsty, over to you. Thanks, Ryan. So I think I'm primarily here to give a bit of an update on the humanitarian situation in Ukraine, where we have been working since 2014, but our work has had to change. So now we are providing bunker kits, which is something we never thought we'd have to do, to children who are trapped underground and missing sunlight, we are seeing vehicles and buildings being targeted for bombing despite having children written clearly upon them. We are seeing parents writing contact details onto the skin of their children so that people know who to contact if they are lost or killed. So far, we've seen 250 children documented as killed. The figure is likely much higher, 400 children injured. A Ukrainian child has become a refugee every second that this war has gone on. We've seen 20 schools on average attacked every day that this war has gone on. Save the Children's founder said that all wars in the end are waged against children and this one unfortunately is no different. We have staff and partners close to the front line working with thousands of refugees every day including those who are streaming out of the steelworks at Maripol where we have seen colleagues of mine are working with people who have not had a change of clothes in two or three weeks, have not had access to clean water, adequate food or nappies for their children. We've had to provide all sorts of very deep, intensive mental health support for traumatised children. Some psychologists are describing the children they're seeing as being in a catatonic state. They simply can't respond to anyone trying to touch or work with them including in one case of a boy that we've worked with, their own parents. He wouldn't allow them to touch him or a doctor to get the shrapnel out of his legs. So this is the kind of work that we are having to do that we never expected to have to do this year inside Europe. So what can happen? There are clearly unbelievable things happening to children and civilians inside Ukraine but there is hope because we know how to respond. So we know how to respond with intensive support for children's education, for their mental health, and to get them the kind of humanitarian aid that they need to stay alive. The two things that we're looking to the UK government to do, we should be confident that the UK government can do because we've done them in the past and we're historically very strong on them. So one is providing adequate humanitarian assistance. So there has been a big uptake in, humani a big uptake in humanitarian aid to Ukraine so far, but what we've seen is it's coming at the expense of other crises. So we are still in the teeth of a pandemic globally and facing an unprecedented global hunger crisis. Food prices are currently at their highest on record and millions of lives hang in the balance. So we cannot see that support for Ukraine, which is incredibly welcome and much needed, coming at the expense of other crises, which is why the humanitarian community would suggest that the support for Ukraine should be in addition to other money provided. It would mean a return to 0.7 in short order, but it would also mean drawing on the Treasury strategic reserves for aid support, as the government has already drawn on the Treasury strategic reserves for support to the MOD. So we would argue that the FCDO response should be no different and should come from strategic reserves. That's what they're for. They're for unanticipated, unexpected crises of magnitude. So that's the first thing we'd ask for. And the second, and again, the UK has a strong track record on this, is championing justice. So historically, we've been very good at documenting war crimes and pushing for justice through various international mechanisms. What Ukraine's children do not currently have is a champion around justice for children, that there should be no impunity for war crimes against them. And if the UK government was to take that up, we would anticipate that we'd be just as successful on that as we have been in following justice in other crises and other issues at different times. Thank you very much, Kirsty. 
Our next speaker is Congressman Ed Royce, who serves as co-chair of the Consensus for, Ec for Development Reform. Uh, Chairman Royce served in the House of Representatives for 26 years, representing California's 39th district, and served as chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee from 2013 to 2019. He now uses his foreign affairs acumen and legislative insight to advise international companies doing business domestically and to guide multinational corporations looking to expand overseas. Um, Chairman Royce, over to you. Ryan, thank you very much. Well, I, I appreciate very much the opportunity to be with you all today, uh, and especially with the members of Parliament and all of those who have been engaged in this effort for, uh, for a long time now to try to see to it that malnutrition and uh, food security uh, is, is uh, solved, is not compounded, and we know that the UK has always been the leader, has been a great leader among nations per capita in terms of what you've done, the example you've set. I know the impact that you've had in your discussions with my colleagues and um, my former colleagues, I should say. So I chaired the Foreign Affairs Committee, but I can share it with you that this year there's been 54 billion in foreign assistance from the United States side and, and, and five billion of that uh, goes to food security. But what we're discussing here today is a problem that is not one that is a result of um, the usual challenge. It is one that is man-made. It is one that in a way is intentional. It's been generations since we've seen this type of war that was intent on actually creating food insecurity in Ukraine. Ukraine was the breadbasket, right, for Europe, for a lot of, uh, for wheat and barley and a lot of the, the grains that people depend on. So when the Russian army came into Ukraine, it is something of a surprise that in their effort of war, not only have we seen war crimes to subdue Ukraine, but we've also seen this new pattern of trying to block the ports and prevent that grain from getting out to people around the world that are absolutely dependent. You and I know that, that in Africa, across Africa, uh, South Asia, people are dependent upon the export. Ukrainian grain typically comes into this market. And every time we see increases in the price of food because of increases, increased costs due to costs in fuel or fertilizer, these components are driving up the cost. And for every 1% increase that we've seen in cost, it's another 10 million people on this planet that are driven into food insecurity, who are driven into a position where they experience hunger. We have unfortunately seen, as a result, a 34% increase. So you can imagine the magnitude of the challenge we're up against. And this, this challenge is just beginning because now we're talking about what do we do to get the grains that the breadbasket, that the farmers of Ukraine have produced, how do we get that to market? Can we reach some type of consensus that we will see to it that the Odessa port remains open so that those grains can be shipped to their usual ports across Africa, across uh, the Middle East and beyond? Or are we going to see that food rot? And if it does rot, where does the money come from for the farmers across U Ukraine, all of those families, all of those companies that would normally seed the next crop that would normally be able to go out and have the return on that investment so they could plow part of it in to the following year's crop. This could be a crisis that compounds upon itself. So our policymakers, you know, across the world, and hopefully at the United Nations, those that, cha that share the values, that we all would hope that, all, that everyone would long for, 
the values of opportunity for everyone on this globe, the value of rights, the value of being able to feed one's family. We know that it's the children who are experiencing malnutrition who, can, who will carry the byproduct of that malnutrition through their lives in terms of a diminished ability to be what they fully could be if we don't find a solution to this. That is why we hope that working together we can address these problems in Ukraine. We can certainly figure out ways to help them get that grain to market, whether it be through the port of Odessa or whether it be some massive strategy to truck and, and by rail get those uh, to the ports in Northern Europe and out and around. We may have to subsidize part of this effort. We may have to go to the United Nations and ask the United Nations in the General Assembly for an effort to open the port, to protect the port, to have <coughs> fleets from all over the world. And by fleets, I simply mean cargo ships. Go in and transfer out those that wheat, that, uh, w those products which are the determinant of whether people are going to starve to death or, or whether they're going to ha have their children malnourished, malnourished versus addressing this problem. And um, I appreciate uh, the UK as always leading in, in these issues and through the debate. I appreciate the special relationship the United States has uh, with the UK and um, especially this forum here today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our final speaker, um, last but not least, is Alicia Kearns, who was elected to Parliament in December 2019, and since her election has been uh, elected to the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Joint Committee on National Security, and has served as a parliamentary private secretary. Uh, prior to being elected to Parliament, Alicia was a counter-violent extremism expert who led UK government interventions in Syria, Iraq, and across 70 countries worldwide while working at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Alicia. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm going to try and uh, cover areas that potentially haven't been picked up as yet rather than try and repeat. Look, we have led, and the UK should be very proud of what we have done in Ukraine. But actually, for me, it's about looking at what we do now, where we go forward, what we need to be tackling. Um, the focus should absolutely be on minimising loss of life. That has to be our priority. That should be our foremost concern. That, alongside protecting the UK. The foremost job of the Foreign Office is to protect UK nationals, to protect our interests, to minimise the risk to our country. And those should be the two things that we are pursuing relentlessly. And minimising death is something we have done a lot of, but actually we've been very focused on the military and we do need to make sure humanitarian aid is getting through. I'm very concerned by the fact that, yes, we have committed a great deal of money in terms of humanitarian aid, but it's not actually getting used. Not enough of the aid money is actually getting through. Not enough of it is actually getting used. And a lot of it is going to neighbouring countries, which is important, but actually we have had some fundamental problems over the last few months with there not being enough presence on the ground. And that is something we have to deal with. The next is justice, absolutely so. Um, I worked on Syria. The UK, when you go around the world, is the foremost expert in how do you collect evidence, how do you get accountability, how do you bring things to the court. The UK government has announced that we are working to support an ICC tribunal or some sort of thing such as that. Uh, today we have the Ukrainian special prosecutor in town. One of the things we should be doing, and PSVI, Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict, is a real expertise of the UK, I want to see a special UN or ICC equivalent sort of body set up solely to investigate war crimes that are related to rape and sexual violence, because they are war crimes. But we do not see them investigated. We do not see prosecutions for them. And that's because the evidence collection happens normally at the end of the conflict, when the evidence is gone, when the women are made to feel that we should be focused on something else, on rebuilding or moving past the shame. And we, look, we should be learning lessons from things like the Balkans, and we should be saying, we as the UK are going to lead, and we are going to set up an organisation to hold to account the use by governments or individuals acting out their own interests, but largely driven by government. We know that Putin and uh, the Russian government have authorised the use of uh, sexual violence as a war crime. We need to be prosecuting them. And that, interna that international organisation could be in Ukraine now, getting the evidence. Ideally, it would also have some kind of victim support element or link through to it. But we need an active organisation who, from the start of a conflict, is focused on getting those prosecutions and making sure they happen. So that is something I would like to see us lead on. 
defections. We've recently seen, uh, in the last few days, obviously a Russian uh, individual defect um, and say that he will not stand by anymore and stand by this. We do need to see more of that, but we need to make sure that when those defections happen, it is heard in Russia. No more can we say it is too difficult to do information operations into Russia. We can't say that. When I used to work at the Foreign Office, I led on all countering Russia state activity in Syria. And when I did it, it was considered incredibly controversial. <coughs> Alicia, we, we can't do this, you know, they're, they're better than us, they've got more tools, they've got the techniques. No, they don't. Russia throws a hundred things at the wall and then they see what sticks and they do more of it. They're not better up than us in information operations, in no way, sense or form. And Russia is not impenetrable. We need to be making sure that messages land within Russia about what the realities are of the war that has been caused by their leader and that has too much public support still within Russia. Uh, diplomatically, NATO, I really hope that Flick's right and that, we're gonna, that Turkey are going to cede because they are currently putting their own personal interests above collective security. The point of NATO is collective security. We as a UK have a particularly special relationship with Turkey. We need to be putting pressure on and making sure that we aren't forcing Sweden and Finland to change their positions on certain political parties um, and that we aren't undermining the rights of the Kurdish people who have not had enough support from the international community time and time again they cannot be used as a jigsaw. They cannot be used as a bargaining piece. Um, the Kurdish people deserve our support and they deserve self-determination for to live their lives freely. Turkey cannot hold this over us and it is wrong if they do so and we have to look very sensibly at that. Domestically, we also need to be looking at the union. Nicola Sturgeon is actively working to undermine and rip apart the union. The UK has proven in the last few months, post-Brexit, when everyone said it wasn't going to be possible, that we are the foremost guarantor of European security. No other country in the world is defending Europe at this time more than the UK. Part of that, a great deal of that, is because we have nuclear weapons. Nicola Sturgeon says that Scotland will remain, will join NATO. They'll be a member of NATO, but at the same time they will strip Scotland of its nuclear weapons. Those nuclear weapons can't go somewhere else in the UK. It's the nuclear at sea deterrent that we have. There is nowhere else in the UK that we can have that at-sea deterrent base. It is impossible. I worked on a Scottish referendum campaign for the UK government back in 2015 when I worked uh, at the UK government uh, in the MOD. It is not possible. We have to fight for our union because it is fundamental to our ability to play that role as the guarantor of security in Europe. Moldova is something I've been talking about a long time. We need to really focus on Moldova and supporting Moldova. Uh, it worries me that we're only now starting to hear the cabinet talk about supporting Moldova. Uh, as a foreign office, I've been talking about since January on the Foreign Affairs Committee, asking for us to go and visit them to understand the threats there and the vulnerabilities. The third nation's point was picked up by many on the panel. Again, the UK has the Commonwealth. We have an ability to activate in a constellation of alliances, to bring people together and to counter them. This is something we have failed at over the last few years. We have not looked enough at the I don't know if you want to call them on the far neighbourhood or the in-between countries or the on-the-margin countries, but these countries Russia and China have been buying up. These are the countries that Russia and China have been influencing and making sure they have the support. And some of the countries who voted the ways they have at the UN on issues around Ukraine should be greatly worrying to us. Countries like Jordan, I love Jordan. It is a wonderful partner of ours, a wonderful security partner. They shouldn't have been voting the way they're voting, and we should look at ourselves to understand why they didn't feel they could vote with us on things like that. Finally, on to the diplomatic effort, China and Russia. We need to be very cautious of not pushing China and Russia closer together. They are not natural bedfellows, but if we are not careful, we will push them closer together. So we need to have an active stream of effort and an active plan in terms of how we're going to mitigate that. Um, in terms of where we go in, in the bigger macro picture, we have to move on from this narrative that Putin must lose. It doesn't mean anything. I would never say to my child, that person must lose. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't teach anything. It doesn't bring us anywhere. It doesn't bring us to a solution. Um, I've been concerned by some of the narratives we've heard in the media over the last few days about who should be deciding what outcomes and what should be the situation. It is for Ukraine to decide when the war ends, hopefully, rather than Russia. And it is for us to make sure that we create the conditions for freedom and for stability and for safety until the end of the bloodshed. But it is not for us to dictate it is not for Macron to say, you must give away certain territories. It is not for former US leaders to say, uh, diplomatic and intelligence leaders to say something similar. So we have to make sure we move to a better narrative and we have to decide within the UK what we are willing to do to help secure that 
fragility, uh, about stability and that peace, but it is about conditions uh, for creating that space, not us imposing conditions on what that piece should look like or what the final outcome is. Thank you very much, Alicia. Uh, we are going to, I'm going to come to the audience uh, for questions in just a few minutes. Uh, but before I do, um, Kirsty, can you tell us how much humanitarian aid is getting through and what sort of development support you think is likely to be needed in the years to come? Because we've heard lots about Marshall plans and things like that. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the Foreign Secretary is right to say that that's the sort of scale that will be required. But we probably need to differentiate humanitarian need inside Ukraine, humanitarian need in neighbouring countries, and then humanitarian need globally as secondary consequences of the war in Ukraine. So currently, of those who are left behind, and I say the kind of scale of movement across the border, it's quite unlike anything we've seen since World War II. But for those who remain in Ukraine, and the small number of people who have returned, 12 million of those people require humanitarian assistance today. And I'd say that's the kind of humanitarian assistance that provides water, food and medicine. So it's the kind of aid that keeps people alive. So there's a need of 12 mil for 12 million people need that inside Ukraine today. There is huge kind of education need, and I'd say particularly therapeutic and mental health support and needs for sort of shelter and support for refugees who are in neighbouring countries. But crucially, the kind of scale that we're talking about, not just to rebuild Ukrainian infrastructure and so on, but as I say, to deal with the global ripple effects of this that the chairman talked about so eloquently in terms of food security are absolutely enormous. And I just see no way in which we can fulfil our part and our sort of historic, but also um, sort of stated ambitions. I see no way that we can do that with 0.5 being treated as a ceiling. Thank you. Um, questions from our audience? Who would like to go first? Libby. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Libby Smith on the Coalition for Global Prosperity. Um, thanks for those perspectives are really insightful. Alicia, you, you touched on sexual violence being used as a, a tool of conflict within Ukraine at the moment. It's another issue that the society are raising with us is that women and children that are fleeing Ukraine are being met by criminals at the border and falling into <coughs> Monday slavery, human yeah. trafficking. It will be great to hear from the panelists how you think the UK and other neighbouring countries can help to combat this. Who would like to go first? Alicia? Yeah, uh, so this is, this is a problem. Uh, so I arranged for a delegation of Ukrainian MPs, uh, four amazing women, to come across um, a few, uh, I guess it's months ago now. Um, and this is one of the things we talked about, because even in the early days, we know from previous conflicts that organised crime groups, any crisis is an opportunity for them, particularly when there's mass migration and mass flows of people. Uh, this is where we have to pull on the UK. Theresa May is actually really focused on this and trying to do some great work on it, which isn't really surprised given her focus on uh, modern day slavery. Uh, this is all about activating Interpol. This is where Interpol should come into their own. Uh, this, but also it's about close working with aid organisations and those organisations on the front line who will come across. I, I spent four months um, on the island of Lesbos pulling uh, migrants, refugees out the water. We don't let people drown. You do not let it happen. And it is very quick and easy as someone on the front line as a humanitarian worker to identify a child on their own, to identify someone who's being trafficked, someone who doesn't quite know what they're doing. It, there's just some, a feeling you get, and we have to work with those humanitarian aid organisations who, in their gut, know that there is something wrong and make sure we protect them. There is a real problem currently which our government is not helping with, um, which is that there is a policy that we are not taking unaccompanied minors in the UK. The reason for that is the Ukrainian government has said we do not want to lose our future generation. I understand that completely. But the UK government is currently misinterpreting that. So that when young children are asking to come with a brother or a sister or a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle, we're saying no at the moment. That's not right. They are not unaccompanied minors. They are coming with a different member of their family because their mothers have to stay and fight or their mothers are medics or their mothers are judges or whatever they are. That is the sort of policy that results in children making dangerous, perilous, perilous journeys on their own. So we need to change that policy. And I've been promised for six or seven weeks now that that policy would change every single week, and it hasn't yet. That's the sort of policy thing that we can do. But otherwise, it's about frontline policing work, Interpol, and working with humanitarian aid organisations to identify those children and to protect them. And then it's about a lot of social media monitoring, because these gangs are out there, and we know who they are, and we can track them. And a lot of their stuff is open source, and you can find them talking about things online. But I think a secondary problem is that those gangs that we can do a lot with Interpol and so forth to try to intercept 
uh, where our police forces can be active and effective. Unfortunately, they also exist in Crimea. They also exist in Russia. They exist in Belarus. And the predatory action here that's occurring on that side of the border, our great worry, is because Russia has been willing to use not only food as a weapon in this war, but also rape as a weapon, the fact that that gang activity will pull that many more people into the shadows. What can we do? How do we address this when it's in this space? On this, we need the assistance of our foreign correspondents. We need to reach out to Ukrainian families and learn more about the stories that come back from those who are disappearing, those who are being pulled east, in terms of what happened, what ultimately happens to those women and children. We want to take those cases of exploitation, and I must say, in terms of foreign correspondence, no one has done the job that the British have done. The British press has carried most of the story to the United States. When we pick up these stories, we see most of them come from the London Times or the Guardian or the Economist. Or uh, it's, it's absolutely a fascinating how British reporters manage to get not only up to the front, but, but wind their way into the lives of the stories of the people at, at tremendous risk. How do we do that in the East? That is something that policymakers really need to discuss. How do we encourage Russians, those brave enough, to come forward and tell us what they know, what they see? I just want to put that on the record because it's something for journalists to be thinking about and for all of us to think about. We had tremendous success with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty at one point in time. Those of us who were in the East happened to travel there in the 1980s know the impact that that was having at the time. How do we repurpose this for a new challenge? How do we get that message in despite Putin's efforts and RT's efforts? We know there's ways to do it. We need to think harder about how to do this. In the meantime, we need to understand more foreign correspondents on the ground, more willingness for us to discuss this underground aspect of the impact on women and children. That needs to be part of the debate. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the only thing I'll add is that uh, a lot of constituents are getting very angry that we're delaying coming through. But we have to point out that every house needs to be checked, you know, and DBS checks, etc. because uh, you're absolutely right. One of my um, constituents went over to the border and said there were traffickers everywhere. You could see them. And he was quite happy that he was going to have to be properly checked. Um, to have the families in, and I don't think people realise quite how horrendous it is out there. I mean, you know, how, how lucky we are to be here. Um, so, uh, you know, but, but I think the aid agencies particularly have responsibility here to pick them up because they're really working on the front line alongside the local, um, local government out there too. And I'm sure that um, Kirsty will have some reflections on that one. Yeah, thanks, Nick. So the thing to bear in mind, Libby, is that th this region already had higher than average rates of trafficking. Yeah. So there was already embedded uh, criminal networks uh, in the region. One of the things that's particularly problematic that um, Alicia has made reference to is part of the delay. So we've seen um, essentially no unaccompanied children come through whatsoever because of this policy decision. But what we are seeing is people crisscrossing Europe going back because the wait is too long. So even people who have been able to make their way at great personal expense uh, and uh, in danger um, are sitting in France and waiting to, they've really run out of money, so they're going back. So we've seen media reports uh, of that so far. And the thing that's different to this migrant flow that is different to the one that we experienced in 2015-16 is, of course, these are by definition just women and children because men are um, conscripted and are having to stay at home. So these are by definition much more vulnerable refugees than we've seen in the past, although, of course, um, all refugees from anywhere uh, whether male or female, um, have kind of equal rights under their convention. Um, but these are particularly vulnerable refugees and the fact that they're making that journey twice in some cases because of policy decisions at this end is something that we could fix. So the, the humanitarian visas could be applied, the speeding up of the visa process is actually within our gift and we're choosing not to. Um, and I was very pleased to hear the chairman's sort of reflections on the British media and I'm sure colleagues uh, from the print press will be really uh, pleased and proud to hear what you have to say but I think we should also just take a small time to shout out the BBC 
which has not just done incredible reporting, but is also one of those great soft power assets of our country that helps uh, not just get uh, accurate information to the people of the UK, but around the world through the World Service. Quite right. I'm kind of addicted to print journalism, but you're absolutely right in terms of the television, but especially. Thank you. We have issued the 100,000 visas so far, and only 50,000 have taken them up. Are you saying that it's because they are not allowed in, because they're, they're not coming to the right relations, or...? Because some of them don't know if they want... Uh, some of them don't, don't want, they to, want to come anymore. Exactly. They've changed their minds. They've decided they can settle in the East. Um, so last night I held the first reception event for Ukrainian refugees in my constituency. Um, I think we had something like 96 Ukrainians that settled just in my constituency. A lot of them I've matched because I have connections to Ukraine, so we've done a matching service with my constituency because so many constituents have been generous. But we've had, you know, yesterday I had someone turn around and say, actually, you know, we've changed our mind, we can go settle in the east of Ukraine. Mm. Um, and I understand why you'd want to do that, you know, why you wouldn't want to leave your country, because those who have come here, um, even if they haven't seen fighting, the trauma and guilt of that feeling that you have left your country and that there are 50 to 100 men supposedly being killed every day, which they're men and women actually, it's men and women who are being killed and who are fighting. That trauma and that guilt is enormously hard. Um, so yes, we have 100,000 visas coming. I, I, there is a clearly a systematic problem at, within the system of the Home Office. It's happened, it doesn't matter who's in charge of it, it cannot respond to crises. It is it's a long-standing issue. And you look back at it and you do history of it. Um, I do think the problem isn't, I don't think it's not willingness. We've said we'll take 300,000. It is a problem within the system. And as someone who rings the Home Office and speaks to them every single day and speaks to the person at the, at the very cold front doing it, but also the senior people, there is a problem within the system. And we have to deal with it. And we have to fundamentally review it. But that review can't take place right now, unfortunately. And that is a real shame. But that is the realities. Uh, next question. Uh, yeah, at the back. Um, my name is Amy Smith. I work for World Vision UK. Um, thanks for the panel for a really interesting discussion. Um, Alicia, you made a really interesting point about the countries that don't feel like they could vote with us at the UN Security Council. <coughs> countries like Jordan that you've mentioned, countries like the Central African Republic, who are either um, caught in conflict or are bordering um, nations that are also caught in conflict. And I guess I'd be really interested to hear particularly the parliamentary parliamentarians' views on what the UK can do looking forward in terms of creating global stability and security and development in those countries, particularly picking up on Kirsty's point about 0.5% being a ceiling and in light of some of the um, rhetoric that we've seen in the recent international development strategy. Thanks. Do you want to start with that? I mean, there, well, there's a massive issue in, in Africa with the Wagner, you know, the Russian Wagner um, mercenaries out there at the moment, and particularly in Mali, um, and we are out there trying to to prevent that um, um, and putting as much aid as possible. I mean, we are going to go back to the 0.7 as soon as possible. Um, you know, people like Alyssa and I are really banging on about this, particularly behind the scenes. Um, Alyssa has got is allowed to do it a bit more than I because I've, I've got a minor government role as a PPS so I'm not able to speak about it in public so much but I, I know that we're, um, we're working very hard on that because it's perfectly obvious that if you don't put security into the countries by you know, helping them whether it's you know, education or food or humanitarian aid generally um, you are going to end up with migration across Europe and, and that's something which I talk about on the doorstep all the time for people who don't understand why we're giving so much aid away but even on the Ukraine, I'm getting emails from people saying, you know, why are we spending all this money on military aid when we've got a food crisis here now and, and cost it, you know. So it's balancing up um, our constituents and, and, the, and the bigger picture. But I know that Alyssa and I certainly look at the bigger picture, but then you have to sell it all the way down. And that's the hard thing as a politician to balance that. I think one of the big problems is that deals with corrupt individuals begets more corruption. And we, as the Western Alliance, or the upholders of values of freedom and liberty, whatever you want to call it, have said that if we support free markets enough, if we support democracy, if we sh celebrate and shout about what we can offer, it will naturally draw people to us. But when you are trying to lead people towards such a big picture, in the meantime, hostile states will get in there and offer meaningful, immediate, tangible financial support which is corrupt and comes from corruption, and therefore you are getting this corrupt system that becomes more and more corrupt. That is not true of all. Jordan is not within that box, but a lot of the other countries are. 
we have been lazy in terms of recruiting people to our cause. We have not recognised that if we do not fight for um, multilateral organisations, if we do not fight for them for presidents of things like Interpol, we have not fought enough as international groups together to make sure that presidents are representatives of countries who have legitimate and respected uh, policing forces and justice systems. We cannot just expect people to come to our cause. We have to fight for it and come to it. And we have a real opportunity now. You have to find the opportunities within the darkness. And the opportunity is that with a food crisis coming, we can create a respectable, sensible, measured and fair system of support for some of these countries who are really struggling. And absolutely, the food crisis sits out there incredibly well. There are so many countries around the world who are worried and who haven't come out of the pandemic as yet and who need meaningful support. We need to get together with our allies. And yes, there is no money. We have just been through a pandemic. There is no money. But we have to recognise that if we don't choose now to defend our values and our interests, and that means shoring up the support of these in-between medium countries, whatever you want to call them, we will fail. And some of the things we've just seen, the, new, the Conflict Stability and Security Fund, there's a really good new focus on some of the Pacific states that we've ignored in the past. They matter. We have to shore them up. The Commonwealth, we have so much soft power, but we need to use it. And we shouldn't be afraid to do it. And we shouldn't just expect that people will see the system that we shout about and herald and go, oh, that sounds great, let's go towards it. Because there is an easier, quicker uh, solution <coughs> often made available to them. And that is our fault. And we can't just say bad Russia have offered something else, bad China have offered something else. We should say shame on us. Why haven't we offered something that people can be drawn to and where they can affect the change they need within their country by coming with us on that journey? I think all of that is true. I, th I think what you said, especially uh, about the aspect of this discussion, for example, the Wagner forces, the willingness of other states to try to undermine the rule of law and introduce corruption. So if you have mercenaries in these Wagner forces, Russian mercenaries, uh, and they're, they're in Africa and they're smuggling gold or getting control of gold mines and so forth, they're becoming richer. But also, as they try to replace state power with their own power, they are, they are ruthless, but they are training these mercenaries. Now these mercenaries return and are sent into Ukraine. They return to Russia, they're sent into Ukraine, and they become a particularly vicious force because they've had no rules and regulations. It's not like a regular army under some set of rules or under the Geneva Convention. These mercenaries come into the fight with the full intention of behaving like marauders. And one of the problems we've had with some of the cities that have been occupied, uh, in particular by Wagner forces, is this, this is where the worst abuses are in terms of torture, but also in terms of rape and so forth. And so understanding that all you say about our engagement in Africa, the collective engagement of all of us across the world who care about these standards, it's absolutely necessary to set the bar higher so that it's harder for those states that inherently do not want to see any element of rule of law or certainly democracy, and we know they're out there trying. We, we know that Beijing isn't exactly an enthusiast you know, for opening these societies. And certainly Russia has become a malign actor in this in, in terms of actively, actively destabilizing states, which put at risk ever more people to malnutrition or starvation. So that's, that's uh, why I'm particularly glad uh, that, that you were on this panel, but also uh, that you're shaping policy here in Britain because this is, part, <laughs> this is part of the wider debate. And also, as the, as the China retreat from their Belt and Road, we're starting to we're looking at opportunities there as well, mm -hmm. alongside with the with the United States and others to to try and get in there and, and replace them because actually countries are are really fed up with China. I mean, I, when I visited Myanmar, they really didn't want to have relations with China. They much they were looking to the West, and that's the same with a lot of countries now. Because as Alicia says, they look to our values, look to things like the British Council and our education system because they much prefer that than being in hock to and debt in places like China. And Russia's just, Russia doesn't actually invest and get, and to, as you say, send the, the mercenaries in um, and create war. So that's, I think, where we need to start, um, as, as Alicia says, pushing much more to, 
to um, put our values over and start getting a better relationship. Maybe, maybe I was against Brexit, but maybe Brexit has caused us to look and be a bit more global on it. But at the end of the day, going back to Ukraine, we have to be prepared to give people the weapons to defend themselves. And we need to step it up. Uh, again, uh, you know, many of us were enthusiasts for getting armaments to people to defend themselves against tanks and aircraft, uh, you know, with anti-aircraft weaponry. Now they're, they're getting those weapons, but we have to continue to work to make sure they get them sooner, that they're in a bigger inventory, and uh, that, they're that there's reliable munitions produced and, and sent because uh, people who are fighting for their own freedom have to know that uh, those who wish them to succeed are, uh, around the world are willing at least to do that. Uh, and that uh, your, your support in that endeavor is very important. Not just to them, but to other countries that will, other people that will know that uh, there, there will be folks who will send, send these munitions to their aid if they're ever attacked. Nick, I know you have constituents in Westminster State. Yeah. If you need to go. If that's okay. Of course, thank please. you so much, and thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Um, next question. Uh, Leila. Hi. Um, how effective do you think the Western sanctions have been on Russia, and is there anything you think that we could be doing differently with that? Um, Chairman Royce, would you like to... I think they've been quite safe, uh, quite effective in terms of making certain that Russia did not even have more power, wasn't more encouraged. Uh, the amount of uh, pressure that's being deployed here and the curtailing of resources has a very real effect upon the Russian ability to, to fund and, and direct war on, at the front. And so uh, I would say that uh, it's absolutely an imperative. Uh, the observation is clear that this is not the only country where Putin says it's, it's part of historic Russia. He's made it very clear that he has greater uh, ambitions in terms of taking over other former Soviet states. And so I think that the fact that uh, the Ukrainians are defending their liberty but also sending a message to others, and that the world has rallied to this in terms of the sanctions against Putin in particular, and those who are giving him the wherewithal to carry out this war, uh, is one of the key ingredients uh, that can bring an end to these hostilities and can protect Ukraine. Bishop. I'm going to disagree slightly in that we, they should have been brought in earlier. Where were the sanctions in 2014? Where were the sanctions in 2016? Um, Syria, there was no meaningful response. I worked on that. Um, 2014, you know, we, we did start doing stuff earlier. I was deployed to Ukraine in 2016 to teach the Ukrainians how to do counter disinformation operations against the Russians. We have been training them for a long time. Sanctions weren't forthcoming. We didn't have the guts to do it. Um, we are now in a place where, yes, there's people aren't buying, the EU is, isn't buying as much coal anymore. That's only hurt Russia by what, about 8 billion a day? They're still buying 23 billion's worth of oil every single day. The sanctions are not good enough. They are not robust enough. We are still giving Russia the wealth they need to be able to fund their mercenaries. Every single euro funds a mercenary. It's not going to anything else. Putin isn't feeding his people. He's not investing in roads. He's not investing in education. He's spending every single penny on mercenaries who are committing appalling atrocities. It is not good enough. They are not far enough as yet. And there is only so far the UK can go. There's a great website on the internet where it shows every single oligarch that should probably be on a sanctions list, every single organisation. The UK has done the vast majority of them. We've gone further than any other country, not just in terms of financial terms, but in terms of sheer numbers. We should be proud of that. But sanctions don't work in isolation. The government knows that. We all know that. Um, our European partners have to step up. And yes, it's going to be painful, but they have to make that choice now for what's going to happen for the next 50 years. What the UK government isn't doing that we should be doing is secondary sanctions. I'm sorry, but countries like Pakistan, countries like Azerbaijan who are <coughs> stepping in to help Putin, to support him, to enable him, people who are flying out the day after, I mean, obviously he's no longer in charge of Pakistan, but the fact remains that the country has not shifted its stance. We need secondary sanctions against these countries because we have to make very clear. It is one thing to not support us and to not choose to vote with us. 
it is another thing to actively support the country that is putting all of us at risk. So we need to go further and we need to do it now. And I, I, We can't really wait much longer um, because we are enabling by not acting and we could be going further. And the Western Balkan sanctions regime that we've just brought in is evidence that we can do things proactively. I chair the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Bosnia. I've been asking for sanctions six, since August. We have finally brought in sanctions about a month ago. We are the first country to do so. We are putting in place proper sanctions in the Western Balkans to prevent the outbreak of war now. They are a tool to prevent, not just to punish. Sanctions should never be there really just to punish. They should be there to affect behaviour change, to affect policy change. So let's use our sanctions regime and bring in secondary sanctions. Um, Can just another one? Yeah. So I think, I think there is a question about consistency and long-termism, and I think the two questions that's just been asked uh, in the previous one are connected. So there is a long-term question, um, as Alicia says, about why we've ended up in a situation where London is such a magnet for dirty money. And there's also a long-term question about how we stitch together various bits of our objectives. So bear in mind, it's not that long ago that the main message coming out of the Munich Security Conference was Westlessness, mm -hmm. that that was the mantra, that actually people just thought the West was missing in action, it wasn't, um, there wasn't a commitment to the prosecution of kind of values in a really consistent way. And we've seen that through the pandemic, and it's not an accident that some countries that perhaps we would have thought of as being natural allies don't consider Western governments to be good faith actors anymore because we've lived through the denial of climate finance that they were promised, and they've lived through very intense and grotesque vaccine inequity. And we sometimes forget because we think these are, this is the policy priority today, that's the policy priority tomorrow. But if you're sitting in the southern capital, it's the same person, it's the same president or prime minister that can't get vaccines to their people, that can't do climate adaptation, that increasingly cannot feed their people. It's the same governments that are seeing we in, in the north and the west as actors not following through with coherent commitments to help and support and stand in solidarity. So I think we sometimes think in silos when actually that's not how foreign policy works. It's relational and it's long term. And people want to know about your reliability as a partner for the long haul. And I think that's where we somewhat sold ourselves short in recent years. And getting back to your point on sanctions, uh, maybe I can close uh, on this note. Um, I, I authored the CASTA sanctions in the U.S. on, on, on Russia. Uh, I want to concede the point that sanctions need to be more robust. You're absolutely right. We need to, uh, that bill became law, but we need, in light of what's happened in Ukraine, to continue to ratchet up on these sanctions. And, and my hope is, uh, in tandem, uh, we can all do this in a way that uh, sends the message, uh, not just to Putin, uh, but uh, to those around him. So, thank you. Um, tempting as it is to carry on, because I know there will be lots more questions, and we are almost at time. So I think now is a good place to pause. Thank you so much for, for being here uh, to our audience, and thanks so much to um, those who are watching online. Can I please ask you to give a round of applause to our excellent panel, Kirsty McNeil, Alicia Kearns MP, and Chairman Royce.